Hey guys, welcome to Overcrest. I'm Chris. And I'm Jake. We have an adventurous episode we for you. We certainly do. We've had a lot of adventuring people on the podcast. Yeah. Whether they're traveling. Adventurers. I was going to say driving. Some may call them. I was, <laughs> was going to say driving a canoe across Canada, but that's not really what you do. You don't really drive a no, canoe. No, you don't. You I paddle a canoe, yep. and, he, and he dragged the canoe across Canada yep. uh, through all the places that he needed to go. We've had that's that. We've also had, called portaging. Um, portaging. That's correct. That is. Uh, yep. Well, I think. I think he dragged it though, because he portaging is when you pick it up and you put it over your head and you kind of. I think just it. any act of bringing a canoe over land to another destination is portaging. You're probably right, and we've had people, uh, the, the young the young lady that drove her motorcycle all around the Elspeth world. Elspeth Beard, yeah, that was incredible. We've had, I mean, we've had multiple, multiple of this explorers, explorers, yes. and that's really close to my heart, right? Yeah. Um, so we have Charlie Whistle, and I think that's how you pronounce his name. We'll ask him when, we'll when, have to when he comes that. on. We'll have to clarify it, and he has been driving his. What is this thing, Jake? So it's uh, it's an O3 Heritage Softail, which basically all that means, all you need to know is it's a uh, Harley Big Twin, but he then proceeded to hardtail it, and it has a extended rigid fork, which means there is no suspension so on this, this thing. Is this is like, is like old school chopper bike. Yeah, like easy rider type yes. of thing with the with the the fork that goes huge way out in front fork. of it. Which you know, this it's not my thing, but no. in general, motorcycles are not my thing. Okay. You know, I think yeah. they're an excellent tool. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to get in. One of the questions I have for him is, is, is basically what is it about adventuring and exploring that makes you want to use a tool for it? Not its intended purpose. Okay. Like I'll drive my 911 out on a forest road. Yeah. Not what it's made for. True. Yeah, Charlie's right. driving this hardtail, easy rider looking chopper. chopper. Yeah. 18. What is it? It's uh, over the last several years. Charlie has ridden his 10 foot 4 inch chopper more than 235,000 miles traveling wow. over roads of 18 European countries, Mexico and all and you 48 just see contiguous some of his United States photos and it's like he's not taking the freeways. No, this is I mean it's serious this business is like, like through the woods like the uh, the road of bones and all this yeah. like it is serious it's serious nuts. exploring. And I've, I've read that he, he has, like, a street tire on the back of the bike. so he, a, he, a, a car tire. Car tire, yes. Yeah. A car tire on the back of the bike. And he's got, I've he had, like, something wrapped around the belt. Like, the belt is exposed. He had something, like, covering the belt. To yeah, like the primary. Get to, to get through some of the some of the places in, like, wow. Siberia or wherever this guy was. is super interesting. And, and I always love finding out why. <laughs> why people do what they do not why that it's absurd well for, it is to me that's it, fair to say it's absurd. i have i have like part of me understands okay. like i understand if you went over to if we walked two blocks away and went to the starbucks and said and walked up to the lady waiting in line for her medium latte and was like hey what do you think of this guy and like showed her on the phone of this dude with his 10 foot four inch chopper <laughs> out on a gravel road in the middle of turkmenistan or whatever right. she would go oh my god what yeah but me i can kind of understand because of the people that we've talked to and and, and kind of The only thing more it. absurd about this scenario is finding you in a Starbucks. Yes, also. <laughs> <laughs> There's some serious exploring for me as well. All right, before we have uh, Charlie on, what have you got for us? Yeah, let's take a minute to talk about the Overcrest Drivers Club. So we just yesterday recorded yeah. another exclusive Overcrest short that are available only for Drivers Club members. You can become part of the club that's right and we're recording this episode right now live on video so you'll be able to watch us, us. do the podcast yes. if you're a driver so like there's member. a lot of like non-verbal things that yes we're, we're always waving our arms come around across yeah <laughs> we're uh, always waving our arms yeah, around. i'm so very you, very emotive with my body expressive. when i'm talking yes yeah so uh head over to overcrestproductions.com slash drivers club head to the website it's right there in the footer of the website as well for as little as five dollars a month you get access to all the exclusive content we have a whole back catalog of exclusive shows and history stories plus speaking of starbucks yeah. It costs the same to buy a coffee at Starbucks You're right. as it does to support the drivers. But here's Yesterday, the I like paid I, I, $6 yeah, for it's a cheaper coffee. Than that. It's cheaper than that. Plus, you get to feel good. Once you drink the coffee, it's over. All you right. do is poop later. Yes. Overcrust doesn't make you poop. It makes you happy, right? So, hey. so it's much better than coffee. Uh -huh. It's much, much better. Plus, you get to support the... You get to support Jake Creators and I then, and, yeah. and Jeff and the rally and everything else. And we've never, over the course of having the Drivers Club... Has made us a good amount of money. Yes. But we have not taken any of it. No. All of we the money. Chris and I have not personally made a dollar off nothing, of this. Nothing. No. We, everything goes back into the rally and the show and yeah. the merch and everything else. All we're trying to do is make this as great as possible for you guys. 
So if you could, I know it's an extra step. Like nobody likes, if you look at your phone, you look at like engagement on your, on like if I post a link on Instagram, like 0.01% people, could, yeah. people don't like to do things. They don't like to install apps. They don't like to go through and follow through. They don't like to click on things. They just like to do what they're doing and continue on. Everybody's got ad blindness. Nobody else. Please support the show. Okay. Download, go. download Simple. Patreon. Go to the driver's club. Five bucks a month. You don't even have to do that. Just go over guysproductions.com. Scroll to the bottom. Click the button. Boom, D- you're done. on your way. You're done. Plus, if you spend a little bit more, you can get even more. That's Just true. Know, there's the option is there. All right, let's get on with, to our interview with Charlie. Hey, man, how's it going? Chris, good. How are you? Good. I'm here with my co-host, Jake, who's actually the guy that owns motorcycles. I <laughs> I only have wiped out on motorcycles Chris when I was young. Chris is a four-wheel only guy. Yeah, so I wiped out once on a dirt bike, and that's as far as it went for me. Yeah, well, that's okay, because it looks like you're into, uh, into some pretty cool cars from what I've seen on your Instagram page. Yeah, I do like the uh, I do like to take the cars out. That's for sure. It's, that's my tool of yeah. exploration. Yeah, you know it's funny. I was, uh, you know, obviously after after we first connected, I I went through your your page, and I was like, oh yeah, so he's a car guy, but we're definitely into the same thing, which is taking vehicles into places that they weren't really designed to go. It's it's funny because we we did our intro to uh, to talking to you, and that was one of the things I brought up instantly was. What is it about? And I was going to save this for way later, but what is it about that? that works why are people that why is it that people that explore pick the tool that is the least adept at doing the job (laughs) like because your bike is like is you you would think you would just take an adventure bike because it would just be way better but you don't why yeah you would yeah you would think that uh and in fact a funny story is that i actually owned a bmw gs 1200 for a few years and I actually, uh, when I started it, started this last trip, I still owned it and I actually sold it, uh, after I started the trip. Um, because you know, the thing just basically sat in my garage as, as much as I pretended to like it, I, I just really preferred my chopper over, over anything else. And so the BMW just kind of sat in my garage and collected dust and, um, yeah, I don't know, man. I mean, like I, I see you doing it and I, you know, I, I, like I know there was a guy in a Ferrari that's done some pretty big stuff. Yep, yeah, we had to him. him. We had him on a while ago. Yep. Oh, okay, cool. Yep. You know, and you see people doing things on, you know, like Vespa scooters or. Yep. I know of a guy right now who's traveling around the world in, in a tuk tuk. Um, <laughs> which, yeah, which, which personally I think is about the coolest thing ever. Um, I just saw someone sent me one of a guy doing a a round trip in a jet ski. And I mean, I mean, holy shit around the world, around the world on a jet ski, just like a Yamaha wave runner. You have to have a lot of fuel. Uh, (laughs) I don't know, man. I I have no idea how it's possible or uh, he's probably just staying close to land. Right. And just, I mean, think either that or he's maybe, or maybe he's towing like a dinghy behind him full of fuel. Yeah. Who knows? That's almost like a guy with a Tesla towing a generator behind his car. <laughs> <laughs> Is it actually yeah. more efficient? Yeah. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So you I don't know. know. So you don't know. You can't put a finger on it. You don't know why. Because I don't know why. You no, know, I think I, I don't really either. And, you know, I think for me, a lot of it is just um, is just like pushing the limits of what's possible, you know. And, I mean, I'll, obviously, you know, this last trip that I did, well, I, I guess I'm kind of still on it. Um you know, most of that, you know, the majority of it in reality was on paved roads where a bike like mine will do just fine. Um, but then obviously, you know, as you probably saw that last, you know, 1200 miles was down the road of bones, you know, in far East Russia. And, uh, you know, which is like, a, a, like a, I don't even know, like, a, like a below average dirt road at best. Right. Um, with with parts of it that are just absolutely decimated and feel more like you're going through a riverbed than a road. Um, just like your spine when you got there. 
when you got to where you were going. <laughs> oh yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I had to have have a have a kidney replaced almost, you know. Um, <laughs> but like I, I think for me, a lot of it was just you know the personal challenge of seeing if I physically could in, endure that level of misery for you know for what ended up being a week. And, you know, pushing the limits of the motorcycle itself, um, you know, and, and trying to keep it alive, which was a, also a bit of a challenge. Um, and I don't know, there's, there's certainly an allure there of, of taking a vehicle, like we said, to a place where it isn't designed and just forcing it to happen just, you know, for no other reason than just to see if it's even possible. We go to the you moon know, because I, it I, is I, hard, right? Isn't that what Kennedy said? We right. go to the moon because it was hard. That's why we do it. Yeah, right. Just to see if it can be done. Right. And um, you know, and for me, I think that that was a lot of a lot of the allure was like, you know, I, I had so many people telling me, um, you know, and especially Russians, as I was getting closer and closer to the start of that road, uh, I was then starting to meet people who had actually done it. And, you know, they were telling me these horror stories of these big BMWs and KTMs just getting destroyed and not making it. And, um, you know, they're looking at me like I'm absolutely out of my mind. And they're looking at my motorcycle and saying, yeah, there's not a flying chance of, in hell that this bike will ever make it. Like, no way. It will not make it, period. Did you agree with them? Because you hadn't done it yet. Were I, you scared? Were you? I, I didn't really agree. Because I know the history on that bike and where I've taken it in the past. Um, but there were certainly, it, it definitely raised some concerns of like, man, like I, like I know this is probably the gnarliest thing I, I, I will ever do on that bike. Um, up until that point, anyway. It might, it might get worse in the future. Um, but it, it definitely made me pause of like, oh, man, like these are some legit, pretty legitimate bikers who have done this. And they're telling me that these bikes that are built for it can't make it or a right. lot of them don't make it. And I'm like, oh, man, OK, you know, what am I getting myself into? And then, you know, add in the add in all of the other elements. You know, it's, it's one thing to go up some gnarly trail in Utah where if you break down, you have cell service someone's going to come along that you can actually speak to. Yeah, I always um, say if you get like people get worried about exploring in the contiguous United States and I'm like, dude, you just wait a little while. Someone will show up. If you you're have on to a be road. really dumb Somebody. to die in the U S yeah, I was on a forest road in Idaho and that Mercedes wagon that I took could not be the more middle of nowhere. Idaho got it stuck in the snow. We had a bike that we brought and put on a roof rack just in case we got stuck. We could ride the bike somewhere and like get help. Right. And like 25 minutes later, some dude in a pickup truck showed up and just pulled us out. There's, there's, <laughs> exactly. there's such little danger in the United States. <clears throat> right. Yeah, that's exactly true. You know, and, and, you know, I would, I would say that even, you know, out there on the road of bones, even, you know, there, there are occasionally people coming along, uh, certainly not as frequently as you would probably find here in the States. Um, but, you know, that, that was kind of the other element was just how remote it was. Very, very few people out there. Big, big distances between villages. No cell service. No shops. No nothing. So if something happens, you're really on your own. Um, what are you thinking about but, while you're out there? You know, uh, after a while maybe. of driving, you, you start to get into your own head a little bit. Yeah, you do. I mean... I would say like, like the primary thought was, was talking to the motorcycle and saying, come on, baby, just a little further, just <laughs> a little further, just keep going, just keep going. Lying to it the and whole then, time. Um, you got, you got hundreds <laughs> of miles to go. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it, and it, and it's just winking back at me like, yeah, I got this. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but you know, most of it, you know, the road itself was such a challenge that thoughts outside of just keeping the bike moving forward, you know, those thoughts weren't really there. Um, I mean, at every corner, the, the road would change conditions. I mean, and we're just crawling along. I mean, I was rarely out of second gear. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we're talking 20 miles an hour for 
the majority of that 1200 miles and at times even slower. Um, the, the few times I got, actually got into third gear and got over 30 miles an hour. I feel like I was flying, <laughs> you know, he's like, I'm like, wow, man, I'm really covering some distance now. You looked at it, you know, you're doing 30 miles an hour. All right. So let's talk about this bike a little bit. Then, then we can talk about, you know, some more of that adventure. What, yeah, where this bike. Okay. I don't know how far back to go, but let's talk about a little bit about the bike and then we can maybe talk about why you, why you bought it. Tell me about this thing, this machine. Sure. So, so I actually bought the, bought the bike 17 years ago. Um, so I've been, I've been riding a while, but now when I got it, it was actually a, a bone stock heritage soft tail. So it had suspension. It had all the bells and whistles, right? It was just a normal bone stock bike. Um, which, you know, didn't really appeal to me, but it had the motor and the transmission and had all the bits and pieces that I wanted, the, you know, the big ones. And, um, and then it gradually over the years has morphed into what it is today, you know, it, cause it didn't go from stock to what it is today overnight. It, it sort of, sort of evolved into that. Um, that's how it works as, as you need, as you need. You do well, things right, right as as it evolves. Yeah, but my question well, is: the evolution it's took does not meet the purpose today, you know. And and it's my question is: did you first yeah. like when you went to to chop it? You're going to do maybe the hardtail first. Were you ever thinking about these extreme adventures when you were doing that? Yeah, yeah, but I I, <laughs> I, I, I suppose at one point I just I I put aesthetics over function. And, um, to, to a certain degree, you know, what good is looking, doing anything if you don't look good doing it. Right. (laughs) It it certainly helps. I think, you know, (laughs) 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 you know, it's like, yeah, you know, it's like, yeah, you could show up in a, in a, like a a little Suzuki sidekick, which would, which would perform just as well as your Porsche, but the Porsche looks a hell of a lot cooler, right? Right. Yeah. I, I, well, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I'm a He's man. He's got a soft spot for sidekicks. I do, I do have, I like, I kind of like everything. Oh, no yeah. I, I like <laughs> everything, I man. I, I, I've owned a Yugo GV. He I likes lo- weird stuff. Yeah. I, I like weird things. Oh, yeah. Yugo. That's a great car. I saw a ton of those when I was in Macedonia. Yeah. That'd be the oh, one to have if you're doing an adventure out that way. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so like the reality is that is that that soft tail was never that great of a bike anyway. It was a very poorly designed uh, motorcycle that the suspension was garbage, the handling was garbage. So you know, going to a hard tail wasn't really that big of a stretch. But I, you know, but in regards to wanting to cover some big miles on it, I also compensated a little bit. You know, I, I changed the rear wheel from a sixteen to a fifteen. So, so that I could run a taller sidewall car tire on it, keep the pressure low, and then I basically get my suspension back through that. And then, you know, the car tire also, you know, I can get 35,000 miles out of it, so I'm not swapping out tires once a month. Um, I heard a lot of people you know, the, have given you some grief about that. <clears throat> yeah, well, the majority of them are people who have never done it. <laughs> and, That's um, usually how it works, man. <laughs> Yeah. So usually my, you know, the first question I ask when they start giving you, you know, me a hard time about it is I ask them if they've ever done it mm-hmm. and then they say no. And then I say, well, then, then how are you really forming an opinion? Yeah. It's the same and, thing with my nine eleven. They're like, well, they can't do that. Why, why are you doing this? I'm like, well, what are you, what have you done with your, first of all, do you have the car I'm driving? <laughs> and, and, and that's right. not like a, like an ego play, right? It's not an ego play. It's like just trying to get people to understand if you if you've never even driven the car, own the car, then you really don't know what you're talking about. You're just going off of just input that you've seen on social media or the internet or TV or whatever of what something is capable right. of. Exactly, exactly. And um, you know, then you know, my other rebuttal to that is typically, you know, like you got to look at this motorcycle. You know, is is this was this thing built for handling? <laughs> Obviously not. So what? So what do I care? about the maximum cornering angle of my back tire. Right. Like I will, I will never achieve that, nor do I care. (laughs) Right. So was was there a seminal moment in your life where exploration became important? Was there anything or was it some sort of evolution? 
I mean, it was a bit of an evolution, but it started pretty young. I mean, I, I come from a cycling background of all things. Um, so I actually like the hipster you know, kind, like fixie bikes or real, <laughs> like real cycling. Yeah. Like real cycling. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I started that real young. My, my parents got me racing when I was like 11 years old, um, which also then coincided with, with traveling because it got me traveling to races. <clears throat> and then when I turned 16, got my driver's license, uh, I was driving this old Volkswagen van. And, um, so at 16 is when I started traveling solo and that's was really what kind of gave me the itch for it and got me going. Um, cause then all of a sudden, you know, at 16, I was like, Oh wow, I can just hop in this van and kind of go wherever I want to. This is pretty awesome. And so, you know, th that radius that I went from home to started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And pretty soon I was just driving all over the country, you know, by myself, just going race to race. And, you know, eventually, you know, the racing kind of fizzled out, kind of how did your, burn out on that. How did your family feel about you? I mean, 16 years old, get in a van. You know, I, I left my kid, like, just last night, I dropped my kid off at skateboarding and just yeah. started to drive away. And my wife was like, oh, my God, we got to wait to see if she gets in the door. And I'm like, no, we don't. We can just go. And she's like, no, we got to see her go in. I'm like, no, we don't. And I drove away. And she was super upset with me. And, and like, so, like, that's what you're doing is a way farther leap than, than that. My kid is nine. So obviously it's a little bit different. How, how does your yeah, family sure. feel about this? You know, I think that, I think that they were actually okay with that. I mean, I mean, also as other doing it, you know, they didn't ever try to stop me. Yeah. But why? Um, that's so it's not normal. I mean, that's, it's, that's. I think, no, that kind of, that really isn't normal. And I, the only thing I can think, is that, you know, the typical 16, 17, maybe 18 year old, you know, I, th I think at that age, you kind of ru run the risk of, of going down a, a bit of an unsavory path, you know, and I think they saw the dedication that I had to the sport. And they knew that I was fully committed to that. And I was, and it was probably keeping me out of trouble. So I think they were probably okay with it, as long as I was keeping myself out of trouble. Yeah, I think that's probably, yeah, that could be part of it. And you also had kind of a nomadic lifestyle as a kid too, right? Tell me about your dad and the, and traveling, moving around. Did that have anything to do with it? Yeah. I mean, we were raised military, you know, my dad was career air force. So we, yeah, we bounced around every two to three years. We'd pick up and move, move cross country somewhere. Um, which, you know, actually he, you know, he has brought that up, you know, to even my, you know, myself and my sister, cause my sister travels a lot too. And you know, outside of moving um, from Air Force Base to Air Force Base, we actually didn't travel much outside of that. When we did, it was typically just to go see family. So my dad was asked us both. He's like, he's like, how did you guys get such this like independent travel bug thing? And because you know, because he was like, you know, you think growing up, moving around all the time, you would just kind of want to settle down. And you know, for me, I think it was again, going back to the cycling, I think that's what really got it going for me. Um, I can't speak for my sister. I don't really know. We've never had that conversation, I guess, but, you know, but I think moving around like that and constantly having to meet new friends every time. And then, you know, a couple of years later, you say goodbye to them and, and then you start the whole thing all over again. Right. I think it, it can tend to make for a pretty independent person. You have to be, you know, you, that's that's you how you cope with it. Yeah. Otherwise, you just right. become miserable. Yeah, you go insane. So, so what, were you living on the cycling or was, I mean, how long did the cycling go on for before you moved on to motorcycles? It, it lasted, let's see, I, I was racing up until, let me think, 30, maybe 32. Okay, um, so 16 to 32, 17. So this is a, I mean, you were apparently pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. I was racing. I was racing full time. And I mean, I was making money from it. Uh, it, it was a pretty meager existence. That's for sure. Um, you know, sleeping in the back of my car, eating a can of beans for dinner kind of situation. <laughs> it was pretty bleak. Um, that probably sounded pretty good when you're on the road of bones though. Sleeping in the back of your car with a can of beans seemed like luxury. Uh, yeah. That would have been heaven. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but there was some crossover, you know, because I started getting into motorcycles in my mid twenties. 
And so for a while there, I was doing both. Um, but, you know, but I, I started to burn out on the cycling. And, but I was not burnt out on the traveling. So I basically just a- adopted the motorcycle as, as the, you know, the new form of transportation. Yeah, and but you're not really getting paid for that. What are you doing for, you know, what are we doing for work that allows you to still travel? Like, how do you make, make those things work together? So I started doing electrical work. I became an electrician. And uh, the, I'm trying to get my, I'm trying to get my uh, timeline correct here. No, no, no big deal. Of, nobody's nobody's fact checking you. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, because there was a point there where there was a lot of crossover where I was doing you know, work, cycling, motorcycling. Um, but 20, let's see, had it, but it must have been about 22 years ago now. I started an electrical contracting business and I sold that two years ago. So I ran that for, you know, t- you know, close to 20 years, whatever, sure. whatever it ended up in. And, and that ultimately was that was what ended up paying the bills. Um, because by that point I was kind of approaching the end of the cycling. So I wasn't really making much money there. I needed a, a legitimate job. Um, so I started doing the electrical very quickly started my own business and then took that up until a couple of years ago. And then, um, <clears throat> towards the end of that, <clears throat> I started investing in real estate and that is now what pro- is what now provides my income. Sure. So this journey that you decided to take, you know, Obviously, it's been an evolution of going farther and farther and farther and farther. But what was the first big leap, the first big adventure that you did, you know, outside of the United States? We're shipping the bike somewhere. We're going for it. The first big one was Europe. Um, Shipped the bike over there, spent a few months trucking around Europe. Um, after that, I went to India. Hold, hold on a second. Um, you can't just skip over. <laughs> you can't just all skip of over Europe. all of Europe. Like, let's, <laughs> w- where did you stay? Where, what, 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 you know, were you hanging out with other, is that, what's the European bike culture like? Is it, I mean, did, did it look out of place? Tell me what that felt like being around in Europe in that, on that bike. Oh man, it was awesome because the, uh, the, the, the chopper culture in Europe is actually is pretty strong. Um, and, and my bike is kind of modeled, modeled around that Swedish style chopper. So, you know, when I got up into Sweden and Norway, <clears throat> you know, it was a, it was a pretty big hit up there. And, <clears throat> you know, of course, you know, through the power of social media, you know, people were watching me making these plans to go over. So immediately people are reaching out like, Hey, here's this event going on, or you should come to our clubhouse and spend the night or come stay at my house. And, <clears throat> So for three months, um, you know, obviously did a lot of camping and, you know, a lot of stuff, you know, on my own. But, you know, there's a lot of nights spending, you know, with people and staying in clubhouses and, you know, like the Rogues MC, you know, those guys have become, you know, pretty good friends of mine. They're based out of Holland. Um, you know, the culture there is, is starting to rival the chopper culture in the U.S., I would say. That blows my mind. So the, is it like is it like an emulation or is it there? Because I I think of chopper culture as being like American, right? You think of like Hell's Angels and Easy Rider, and you think of these things. Is it an emulation sure. of that, or is it or is it did it start the way and it's become its own thing, or how did it come about? I would say outside of the Swedish style choppers, which are very much their own thing. Um, yeah, it does kind of emulate what's happening out here. For sure, because even if you go like it's funny, uh, like I went to this party in Italy. It was way up in the mountains, um, <clears throat> out in this field, and you know, I mean, if you, it's like if you closed your ears, right? Turn if you turned off the sound and just looked around, you'd swear you're in like Alabama. <laughs> it was, it, like the way people were dressed, you know. Then open your ears again, and then you know they had this. Uh, CCR cover band playing, and there's like a, 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 a Confederate flag flying. What? And <laughs> wow. Oh, oh, they're all about that. I, I, I've tried to explain to a couple of them, like, yeah, you know, this isn't really like, you know, maybe, maybe cool. not, maybe, maybe not yeah. that. Maybe everything else, okay, but maybe this, this part, maybe not. <laughs> right, right. And I've kind of tried to explain that a little, but 
for whatever reason, a lot of those guys have latched onto it, but but there's clearly uh, a lack of understanding of the history behind it, right? Right. Um, so, like I said, I've, I've tried to explain, but yeah, it's hard, it's hard to do. Right. So, but but you know, you also look around at all these amazing motorcycles. You're like, wow, man, it's like a lot of cool vintage stuff, like panheads, shovel heads, and these radical choppers. You're like, man, like I would not have expected to see this in Italy, right? But then there's this like weird switch that also goes on because you have that happening, and then all of a sudden the dinner bell rings and everybody stops and sits down together and has like a hundred person family style pasta dinner. <laughs> and they're like, well, they're like this is awesome. <laughs> so it's it's, it's so like the, the biker culture here, but the food is better. There you go. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, that family style dinner where everybody stops and sits down to eat together, which is really, really neat. And uh a brief segue here. My wife and I actually started the Marinara Mountain Run in Colorado, where we did just that. We enjoyed that aspect so much, and it was something we had never experienced in the US that we thought we have to bring this home with us. So we started the Marinara Mountain Run. And we did just that. At dinner time, we ring the bell and we feed everybody pasta. That's cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Did you yeah. switch out the PBR for Pegronis then, or Peroni? Peroni, yeah, Peroni. That's it. Pegronis and pasta. <laughs> Peronis, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> so after Europe, where did you where did you go? So you got your fill of Europe. Are you starting to realize that yep. it, it needs to be? Well, before we get into it getting harder, what's your kit like? Like when you go out, you said you can't, you camp sometimes you're on, your bike is not an adventure bike. You don't have, you don't have these huge side saddle bags from what I could see, like the huge aluminum cases on there the where these guys can no. take enough food for like three months. You know, they can take everything where if they tip the thing right. over, they can't even pick it back up again. It's so filled with shit. Um, <laughs> exactly. So what are you bringing with you? Um, so on this last particular trip, you know, I, I use the, uh, the Moscow moto setup. I don't know if you've ever heard of Moscomoto. No. Um, but they make a really nice soft bag system, obviously designed for big adventure bikes. But um, I hit them up, and I, I was like, I kind of want to see if, if this would work on my chopper. And they're like, yeah, bring it over. So um, dropped it on there, and I was like, oh, my God, this is like, it's like it's built for it. It's perfect. So the luggage system itself is great. Um and then on this particular trip, I brought tons of tools, which I tend to anyway. Uh, but I definitely brought more than normal, uh, tons and tons of spare parts. And then on top of that, it was basically camping gear and clothes, sure. really. But, but the majority of my stuff was um, was parts and tools. So what kind of parts are you going through when you're doing this? What's the common points of failure? What are some of the hardships that you have or... Tell me some place that you've broken down or what you did to deal with it, that kind of thing. Yeah. So, you know, on this trip, the, the biggest, uh, <clears throat> the biggest weak point turned out to be my starter, um, which is currently cobbled together using the guts from a Honda Civic starter and a piece of a Red Bull can. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah. So if anybody ever opens that up, they're going to be like, what in the hell is happening inside this thing? But it works. <clears throat> um, spare belts, uh, took a complete charging system because I have lost charging systems in the past, uh, spare clutch coil, um, you know, then small stuff. Uh, can you still kick this? Plug. Can you still kickstart this thing if you don't have the starter? No, it doesn't have a kickstart on it. Okay. So Jake here has a <laughs> well, bike. Very... I had a, no, not it. Mine's not a big twin. It's an old, uh, um, iron head that I hardtailed and oh, made kind of a bob yeah. rata. But of course I took the electric start out and put, you know, a kickstart on, but iron heads, sure. especially this one's a high compression and notorious for like breaking your ankle. And I just couldn't, right. I couldn't kick it over. <clears throat> well, and that's the kind of the reason why I've never put one on mine. Cause a lot of guys mentioned that like, man, you should just put a kickstart on this thing. I'm like, man, this is a 96 inch twin cam. Yeah. Like, I don't know if you could kick it over. Because, <clears throat> because not only you know the the uh, compression issue, which you know I think yeah you could kick that over, but the timing on a twin cam was never designed to be kicked. 
So I don't know, like it would be a total pain in the neck to try to get that time. Oh, it's right. probably got about a bunch of advance. So it's just really hard to get mm-hmm. going in that way. Got it. Got I it. Got would, it. I would imagine. It was like, no, nah, I'm easier just finding a hill to park on top of. Right. And bump start. So I'm looking at this picture of your bike on the beach and you say you've got a ton of parts, but I don't, I mean, you <laughs> still looks pretty minimalist from what I'm seeing in terms of what you're able to actually bring with you. I mean, realistically compared to what most people would think you would need to bring, which would probably be. They would probably think you'd want to haul a whole engine on your back, you know, because something's going to break. But it seems pretty right. minimalist. Yeah, it's just, it's just leaned, it, leaned it down as I, as I was able to get it. And, hey, as, as stuff but, breaks, it just gets lighter <laughs> as, as you go along, as, exactly. as you head out. <laughs> exactly. All right. So tell us about the, the impetus of this trip that, that you're, well, you're I, on. Oh, go, I wanna, go ahead, Jake. I have a big question about the yeah, bike. Go ahead. You go know, ahead. the hardtail, sure, that's reasonable-ish, and you, the rest of it is kind of, you know, more or less still the bike. The big thing for me, and I'm not a chopper guy per se, but the massive extended rigid forks. Explain this to me. Yeah. Like, what... What is that getting after? What, where did, first of all, from like a, a chopper culture, where did that come from, first of all? And why, why do that? Well, I mean, it's, it's definitely just a look that people like and go for. Um, so when I first chopped the neck on that frame and raked it out, it originally actually had an 18 over telescoping front end on it, um, which was considerably shorter than the bike is now. <clears throat> but the issue with it, which I learned over the course of a, a, a f- summer over five months, where I did all uh, of the uh, of the forty eight states, um, so it was a pretty miserable summer. It turned out because <laughs> um, the, the issue with that eighteen over telescope in front end is that it didn't actually telescope, it didn't move, function as actual suspension, but it was also so rigid that it didn't flex. So. <clears throat> It was truly rigid front and rear at that point. It was, it was pretty awful. <clears throat> so at the end of that summer, I was like, man, something's got to give. I, I can't do that anymore. Um, my options were to either put a Springer front end on it, which I didn't like the idea of because I don't like the idea of all the maintenance that comes with it. Um, and I figured the chances of me breaking a Springer were pretty good. So then the only other option then was to do a rigid front end which ironically is going to flex more than a telescope in front end will um the the key though with that is a is that you have to go longer so the longer it is the more it's going to flex yeah so i I had a buddy come over uh who's a fabricator he brought these five foot long pieces of steel tubing that we were going to use for the fork legs and he brought it over we're sitting in my garage and originally the conversation was, well, bring them over and let's figure out how much we have to cut off. So we put the bike on the lift and we're eyeballing it and sitting around staring at it, jaw jacking. And by the end of it, I was just like, screw it. Let's just do the full five feet. <laughs> Call it a day. It's a lot less work. Just even, You don't even have to yeah. cut it. You don't even have to cut it. So, so yeah, that's what we did. <laughs> we're like, man, this might be totally insane. Let's let's just try it and see what happens, right? And so we did it, and I'll be damned, it worked really well. So and now the bike actually rides pretty what, smooth. What kind of stress is that putting on like the neck and the handlebars and everything else where it mounts up to the bike? Has there been any like stress fatigue or anything there? It's just, did you? I've broken the frame. Yeah. Broken the frame one time, but believe it or not, it wasn't at the neck. It was about halfway down. <clears throat> it was about halfway down the tube between the neck and the lower motor mount, is where it broke. Um, so we just uh, basically cut it and threw in a gusset and welded it back together. Where was that? Sense. Oh, that was at home. I was in Colorado when that happened. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. right. Well, welders well, are usually well, pretty that's available that's wherever. That's right? true. That's true. Totally, yeah. Well, the funny enough, my my wife, her and I were out on a ride together. We were only maybe five miles from home. <clears throat> Something happened with her bike. I don't remember what, but it, it got me grabbing my tool bag off off of my bike. So I took my tool bag off, and that's when I saw the crack. It was mm. hidden behind the tool bag, and I never saw it. So her bike breaking down led to me noticing that the frame was broken on mine. So at that point, we just said, "Yeah, let's just go home." 
<laughs> All right. So this this current trip. Tell me tell me about this current trip. A two. I so, guess you're probably on letter R now. It sounds like. If you're thinking of an A to Z uh, trip. <laughs> yeah. Well. Yeah. Well. I think we started at Z uh, with the road above because that was after the end. <clears throat> um. So it started out. Uh, I left home December 10th of last year. So we're approaching one year here pretty quick. Um, and of course, you know, the middle of winter in Colorado. So went straight South, went down to Puerto Vallarta, <clears throat> um, met a buddy of mine down there, hung out there for about a week, uh, turned around, went back up to my sister's house for Christmas in Arkansas. And then went from Arkansas to Wichita to do a top end rebuild on the motor before I really hit the road. Um, and then from there, made my way over to Los Angeles and then up to San Francisco, saw a friend of mine there. <clears throat> and then she's the one who sort of planted the seed of, cause we were, I'd been joking around. I was like, I was like, man, if I keep going any further South, cause when I hit San Francisco, I didn't really know how far North I was planning on going at that point. I was like, ah, it's the middle of winter. I don't want like, you know, I don't want to go too far North. But then we started joking around like, ah, would it be funny? Like if I ended up like in <laughs> Seattle, and, you know, which is like the absolute furthest point away from Miami, Florida that I can get, which is where I needed to be. And we're like, ha yeah, funny, funny. Wouldn't that be funny? So long story short, a couple of days later, I was like, yeah, I'm doing that. Screw it. So I looked at the map. I was like, what is actually the furthest Northwest point of the lower 48? And it turns out it's out there on that reservation on that peninsula um, west of Seattle. Nia Bay is what it's called. So I sent her a message. I'm like, I'm going to go to Nia Bay. That's the furthest I can get from Miami, Florida. So sure enough, I went up to Nia Bay, um, went and saw some family in Seattle, and then uh, headed back south to back down to Phoenix, basically, and then across over to Miami. And then Miami is where I shipped the motorcycle uh, over to Amsterdam. And then uh, re-picked up the trip there. And then I wanted to hit the furthest west point of Europe, which is uh, Boca de Roca, Portugal, which is a, basically a lighthouse right outside of Lisbon. <clears throat> so then I went from Amsterdam down to Lisbon, basically. And then... Um, the friend of mine who had been staying with uh, up there in Holland puts on a motorcycle show every year. So he talked me into coming back to Amsterdam for a chopper show. So, so then it was, so it was Amsterdam, Lisbon, back to Amsterdam, was there for another few days. And then uh, from there, went across Germany into the Czech Republic, went south into Austria, went back west into Switzerland south into Italy, um, went about went about halfway down to Italy, then turned around, went back north, uh, looped over into Slovenia, dropped into Croatia, and started hitting like all those Balkan countries, Bosnia, uh, Albania, Macedonia. So is there Mexico. any hardships along this along this journey so far um, or any like really exemplary moments that really create a great contrast in your life? I mean, honestly, at this point, everything had been going pretty smooth. The bike had been functioning well for the most part. Did that uh, bum you out that you, that everything was fine? <laughs> yeah, well, no, it, it didn't because, because I was still battling winter weather at this point. Mm. So, you know, like trying to get over the Pyrenees in a snowstorm twice, actually, because I had to get over southbound to get down to Portugal. And, um, I mean, that sounds like so, a hardship. You said there weren't <laughs> hardships, and here you are. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's true, I suppose. I guess I don't really see it as a hardship, because I just see it as just, it's just part of the deal of, of traveling in that time of year, you know, at, at those elevations. But, yeah, but going over, going over the Pyrenees in the middle of the winter, yeah, that's a bit of a hardship. <clears throat> um, Do you ever change out your, uh, your rear car tire to, like, a, a winter snow tire? 
dude, there were there were times where I could have used it. Um, <laughs> there were some pretty long there were some pretty long stretches. Uh, in fact, there was one particular day that was was pretty challenging because it was snowing heavy enough that I was, I was having to stay in the tracks of the car in front of me. And but it wasn't quite cold enough to make those tracks freeze. So it was wet. But if I came out of that track, I was going to be in the snow, you know, a couple inches right. of it. Wow. <clears throat> and this one. Yeah, and this went on for hours. And um, simultaneously, uh, I was having issues with my carburetor. And now what I thought it was, turned out it wasn't what it was at all. What I thought was happening was that was I was pulling water into it because there was this, an enormous amount of water spraying everywhere. So I just assumed I was pulling it into my, air, into my air cleaner. And the bike was running like absolute garbage, but it was still running. So I was like, meh, whatever. And... I finally, I finally call it quits that day. I'd had enough. I was soaking wet, freezing cold. It was miserable. Um, and the roads were getting worse and worse. So I ended up in this town in Spain. And I actually ended up being there for like three days, having to, w- w- having to wait out the storm. Because um, it actually got worse the next day. And then, so the road clears off. And I go again. But it's, it's still wet. There's still a lot of road spray. And so the bike's still not really... Re- you know, still not perform, you know, performing all that well. But at least you've got a windshield if someone's in front of you. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Exactly. Yeah. Well protected by all those fairings, right? <laughs> um so same thing, end of the day, pull into this little hotel, some you know, roadside hotel, and uh get up the next morning and now the bike wouldn't even start. I'm like, what the hell is happening? This bike won't start at all. And I'm just I'm tearing this thing apart. Long story short, it turned out that the little uh, push rod for the accelerator pump had just magically disappeared. <laughs> no, no idea where it went. Just gone. And how, yeah, which is why the bike was running so poorly, is because I had I didn't have any acceleration. It was just you know basically firing on that on the one jet, right? Yep. And uh, and uh, so I found this guy. Uh, didn't speak English at all, but he had a shop across the street. Well, I ended up using, I found this little, uh, a little Torx wrench, a tiny little Torx wrench that was almost the exact same size as that push rod that, you know, well, that I was missing. It was the exact diameter, surprisingly, but it was a little bit long. So I used his, his, his grinding wheel and just basically shaved it down to size and Stuck it in there and it worked perfect. Bike, bike started up and ran like a champ. Is it still like that in there? Oh yeah, it's still there. That's awesome. You know, I get <laughs> yeah. so there's a there's a buddy of mine who his name's it'll Alex. Be there forever. It, it'll last forever unless unless it gets lost again and then you just have to find another <laughs> another animal to him. So my, there's a bike. No, I, bu- I made it longer so that so, so that I actually made it better than the original. You've improved so it so that it can't. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah. Well, you're good to go. There, I have a buddy named Alex who's a, a really intelligent guy and he is, he builds the most amazing cars and he's incredibly smart, borderline genius. And he keeps harping on me about carburetors. Okay. And I've got carburetors on my Mercedes. I've got carburetors on my nine eleven, And one of the reasons why I like the idea of a carburetor is because it is a, con- it is a mechanically contained system that if my push right. rod falls off, I can go figure something out. I can figure it out. If something fails with an ECU or or some sort of sensor and the car won't run because it doesn't have a crank position sensor, it won't start, I can't fix yeah. that. I'm in wherever yeah. I am. I can't fix it. I have to wait for Amazon or FedEx or if where you are in Spain, how are you going to tell? What are you going to? You're going to have to sit there Google, okay, how do I say throttle position sensor in Portuguese or whatever? <laughs> and you're going to have to go find some guy that can maybe help you find this random part. It's too hard. It's really hard, but carburetor, yeah. carburation, you can usually, you can figure it out. You can b- bring a rebuild kit with you, and then you pretty much have everything you need to keep the engine running. I 100% agree. Yeah. And and, and, I, and I have the same motivation, you know, the same reasoning. Yeah. Because you could have put standalone on the bike, and as long as it kept running, it would have been probably much better than the carburetor. But if it broke, you were screwed. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, no, I, I like things simple and and repairable on the side on the side of the road. 
Plus, it gives so. you a sense of pride if you're able to do something like that. And I don't know what it is, but doing some sort of MacGyver fix or figuring out a way, <laughs> a, like a, a workaround to get things running. Duct tape and bailing wire. Whenever I'm able to do that yeah. in a car or a project, I'm always like, yeah, I, I'm pretty good. I'm pretty good. I like yeah. myself right now. It, it's a great <laughs> feeling. It, do, it does instill a sense of pride, for sure. I think it becomes a part of the part of the journey. And I think one of the reasons why, you know, it's great and what you're doing is great is because it gives you an opportunity to overcome something. You know, I think that maybe goes right. back to, you know, using things as they were not intended is that maybe, maybe it's a, it's a guy thing. I don't know. We've had a couple of women explorers on the podcast too, but I think maybe it's a guy thing. Maybe it's a human thing that in today's society, everything's pretty easy, right? Well, I mean, yeah, yeah, but you, you got to remember that most women are considerably smarter than most men. True. <laughs> and when yeah, they do that's this, a, that's a great point. That's a great point. So, Much more so interested in self preservation. Yeah, we go out and do things in the most, in the hardest way possible. And, th and they're just looking at us like we're a bunch of idiots. Like, why, why would you do that? <laughs> that's because we are, generally. <laughs> yeah. I, I think yeah, that, I think exactly. that we are. But I think we, maybe we need that. Maybe that's, it's part of, Maybe we're fulfilling something primal, you know, and maybe some people well, need it. Some people don't, but maybe it's a primal thing. Well, I think it is. And in all, in all seriousness, you know, you know, there's a lot of women out there doing it too, but I think, I think people just enjoy putting themselves into these difficult and potentially dangerous situations just to you know, partially to see what they're made of. I think is a lot of it too. I mean, I mean, what logical reason do you, does a person have to, to go out and climb Everest, right? There's no good reason to climb Everest. People have been up there. The pictures have been taken. You know, it's, it's been researched. There's a real reason to do it, other than the personal challenge. And I and I, you know, and, and you know, and trying to test yourself and, and see what you're made of, and, and post what, what you're actually capable of in a in a life or death situation, or just in, in even a a very difficult situation where you're on your own and and you have to rely on yourself to get yourself out of it. For sure. And I think that there's, for at least for me, when I'm doing any kind of exploration, I think I've become um, addicted to the contrast that it provides you to relate other experiences that you have to the experiences you've already had. And the more breadth you can get in, in that realm, the more you can understand, you know, the joy of other things that you're doing or the pain of other things you're doing because you have more reference points. You have this constellation of experiences that you can go back and reach from and you can be like, wow, this is way better than being in a car with beans or this is, <laughs> this is way better than that time I had to cross the mountain and I was wet and the car was or the bike was running like shit. Like I got stuck in a bomb blizzard in my Mercedes one time and I had to, when I woke up in the morning at the hotel – because I couldn't even climb the hill. The car would not do it. So I'd turn around and go back. And when I woke up, you could not even see the car. Gone. And, like, I can yeah. go back and I can look at these experiences. And I had summer tires. And you, sometimes you learn things, too. Like, maybe not summer tires when you're going to drive across the country in, in, in winter. That kind of stuff. Anyway, I think that's, right, that's a right, big part right. of it is just that constellation that you create for your own psyche. Yeah, and it definitely, and it definitely builds confidence in, in every other aspect of your life as well. You know, it's like, it's like you said, well, I survived that. I can definitely survive this. And I think there's, you know, I've listened to some psychologists uh, on some other podcasts and stuff like that. And they say that when someone is adverse to something, they, they always go to the tarantula thing, right? That's always the, the thing that they talk about is the tarantula in the tank. And someone's got, you know, uh, what, what is one of your scares? Oh, arachnophobia. Right? Arachnophobia. Right? You, sure. can't, you see a spider and you, and you go through the roof and you leave the house and you can't go back and you have to bomb the whole house. <laughs> okay. So this is like an extreme case, right? So then what they do is they go, okay, can we at least get you in the same room as the spider? Can we, right. now that we've done that, can we cross the room? And pretty soon the person's like petting it like it's Fido, right? They're over there like petting the spider. Because once once you have that once you have these experiences, you realize things aren't so bad. And then you've got a reference point of like, oh, yeah, well, petting the spider wasn't so hard. It's, it's great. I'm not scared of spiders anymore. And I, and like So a, in this analogy, did Charlie not like motorcycles or where's this going? I'm talking on it. <laughs> I'm talking as a general sense of people that are adverse to experiences you're, that are you're hard. getting outside your comfort zone yes yes you're 
I always say if you're not exploring, you might as well be dead. Because if you're not giving, and I don't mean it does, like I always say, it doesn't have to be bikes or cars. It can be food. It can be travel. It can be going in a, on a bike ride in a different place. As long as you're experiencing new things, you're enriching yourself and you're enriching your mind and you're building in that, in that constellation. I think it's the most important thing that we can do. I, I do agree with that. And I, I agree with all of that actually is that it, you know, it doesn't necessarily even have to be travel or even, you know, long range, long distance stuff either, you know, and I get, you know, people ask me all the time for pointers of, of how to do this stuff. And I'm always like, listen, like you don't have to leave for a year and, and, and do this massive trip, you know, take off from your house on Saturday morning, go spend the night somewhere on, you know, that night and come home Sunday, like just, Start small, you know, and, and, and build that confidence. And, and slowly but you know, surely you'll be on the road of bones because it is a, <laughs> it is an addictive thing, yeah. exploration. It, 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 yeah. it truly is. Well, yeah, because, because, you know, once you've done one thing that you, you know, that you thought was so, so-called epic, you know, mm-hmm. then you're like, well, there's gotta be something even more epic than that. Where's that? How do, how do I do that one? Dude, I am so bored of driving the United States. I had a couple uh, couple trips lined up through different companies that I was going to do with my 911. And maybe I have an Isuzu Trooper that I'm swapping an engine into and doing some other things. And I want to go so many different places. I want to get out of the United States. I want to do, I want to go through Baja, Mexico and take a boat across to Mexico and then go down to Panama and, and ship it over to Colombia and then go all the way down to Tierra del Fuego. I want to do these things. And I, yeah. I kind of want don't want to plan too much. I just want to kind of want to go, you know, I just kind of want to do it. And I also don't want to die or, well, get, yeah. or, or get murdered <laughs> or get chopped up into little pieces. Right. But I think all that stuff is, you know, if, if you do it right, I think it can be a little, obviously this stuff is dangerous, but you know, the fear of, of getting kidnapped, I think is a little overblown, but you do have to be, well, you, the cartel is there. It is there. But I think, does that something you ever consider when you're, when you're traveling is your own personal safety? Because you're alone a lot. No. I am alone a lot, but no, I don't really worry about it too much. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll do a little bit of research on, you know, parts of a country or city that I should maybe avoid. But even then, if I'm being real honest, I'm pretty lazy about it. I just kind of wing it. And I feel like I have a pretty decent sense of when I'm getting into an area that maybe I shouldn't be in. Yeah. Um, Spidey sense is good stop. at that. Yeah. Yeah. I just stop and go back like eh, this doesn't feel quite right i mean let's be honest though charlie there's something to be said about the fact that you look like a complete badass and are a complete badass yeah don't don't fuck with me that's basically what it is right yeah i mean you are looking and giving off a different vibe than chris would be pulling it in a vintage 911 it's true (laughs) chris is like hey i'm i don't belong here come rob me you're like oh don't mess with you yeah i look a little tender (laughs) <laughs> yeah, me well, I, I think it, it only works for me until i open my mouth and then they're, and then they're like oh, oh this guy's actually pretty harmless <laughs> yeah, no, that's usually that's usually how it works you got the big bouncer standing in front of the club and he, they're like oh hey come on in they're always you know, usually pre, usually pretty yeah. nice guys so where are you now uh, i'm in manzanillo mexico uh i've been here for going on a month um trying to get my motorcycle okay well, trying to get home Okay. Uh, What's going on? So, so, well, I flew down here uh, three and a half weeks ago, thinking I'd be here for maybe three or four days, pick up the bike and be back home. I thought I'd be back home already. Um, Having some uh, pretty sizable issues with customs. Uh, They were not not happy that I had sent all my luggage with the bike, even though I told them that I I really had no option. I was like, listen, with all the sanctions uh, right now against Russia, I was like, I, I, like, I don't know what else to do. Like everything has to go with the motorcycle. And so, um, what do they think you're doing? I mean, are they just being assholes or is there just, or is it red tape? Is it just stuff they have to do to mess or are they just messing with you? Honestly, no, I think it's mostly red tape. Um, I think it's a combination of things. There's a lot of red tape. Uh, the original shipping broker that I hired, um, turns out was relatively incompetent um which added to the problem he never i mean no matter how many times i explained it he can never quite figure out that i needed a temporary import and not a permanent import Mm. and 
which seems like a small thing. Well, it's a big thing, but the, the, it, it dramatically changes everything about the import process because one of his temporary, that's a, that's a whole different process than bringing something in permanent. And, and then he was all bent out of shape because I had all my luggage and, you know, on the bike. And so he actually fired me as a customer. So <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. I was like, Oh, that didn't go well. So, you know, I'd only been here for maybe three days and that's when they inspect the crate and they see all the stuff and he made, immediately gets pretty irate about it and then fires me. He's like, he's like, I can't help you. You know, you're, you're, you're going to have to find somebody else. That's my worst so, nightmare is hiring a fixer of some sort and it not working. And then maybe you stuck right. somewhere and not being able to figure it out. So please explain to me what my worst nightmare would be like. <laughs> <'Cause that's... laughs> I'll, tell, I'll tell you what I did. Here's what I did. Uh, I started basically cold calling uh, shipping brokers. Um, and I found, I found one person who said, yes, I can help you. Yes, I can get everything through your luggage, your bike, everything. But it's going to be like $7,000. Oh, man. And I was like, I was like no. Absolutely not. That is like, I'm sure you can do this, but you're gouging me because, because you know, I'm stuck Yep. and I'm, I'm not okay with that. Um, so then at that point, uh, I, I went and used the power of social media and I put a post up of like, Hey, here's where I am. Here's what's going on. And here's what I need. And I had just countless messages from people. Um, a lot of them, not so useful. Some of them borderline, you know, maybes. Um, but then a couple of them ended up being very, very helpful and ultimately led to the broker that I'm now using, which is who has been a tremendous help, uh, along with a couple of other local bikers, um, who have been sort of also helping with the import process. And, and kind of being the go-between between myself and the, and the actual broker. So it's, it's worked out pretty beautifully. Um, he's, you know, he's charged me a very, very fair rate, um, which I'm more than okay with. And uh, the last two days, the reason why we've had such a hard time connecting is like this morning, we were over at the Bonhartcito trying to get the temporary import uh, for the motorcycle, which we now have. So that's a big hurdle. And then I was also trying to get myself legal because uh, when I flew into Manzanillo, you know, and got off the plane, they only gave me 20 days to be in, to be in country, which I thought at the time would be more than plenty. Well, that 20 days came and went, and all of a sudden I wasn't supposed to be here. So I had to go down to the uh, immigration office. Do they come looking for you? I mean – I mean, here, I, here, was, you, was, if you don't show up to the immigration office, they don't care. They just stop looking for you. But is it different down there? Are they on on the hunt? It sounds like actually, yeah, they <laughs> they will. Because I was talking to a Canadian guy in there, and he was like, "Yeah, my my card lapsed by two days one time. They were knocking on my door." Hmm. I was like, "Oh, okay, good to know." So, yeah, that's that's kind of why I've been hard to get a hold of the last couple of days because uh, I've been trying to get everything it's legal. All, it's it's all good, man. So you, you're driving home then. From here, you're going to go through Mexico and head back. Uh, yeah. yeah, and uh, it's, depending on when I get the bike, which I'm hoping is tomorrow or Thursday, if I get it tomorrow or Thursday, I'm actually going to ride to Cozumel, which is 1,500 miles in the wrong direction. Um, but my wife will be in Cozumel tomorrow. So I'm going to go meet her, hopefully. And then, uh, then at that point, turn around and then go back to Colorado. I'm kind of looking at the and, map here uh, where all these places are. There's Cozumel over there. Yeah, that's not, I mean, that's not right <laughs> around the corner. That is, that is no. serious business. Yeah. Yeah. It's the wrong direction for sure. Um, <laughs> hey, when a man's yeah, been alone, know. a man's been alone. That's, <laughs> I, that's, it's worth the drive. I've, I've made some 26 yeah, hours and 19 minutes. Yeah. I would drive that far if I were you. <laughs> yeah. And at this point I'm like, whatever, what's another, what's another couple thousand miles? Who cares? Yeah, yeah, for um, sure. But but if I don't get the bike in time for that, then I'll just I'll just go straight home from here. Right, right. And hopefully, uh, hopefully not find snow. Although it is snowing back home today. Well, I'm not even gonna look out so, the window right now. Yeah, we we're, we're in Minnesota, here. so it's it's we're already oh, out. Yeah, we're all done. Okay, I won't complain then. So 
What's next then? Yeah, that begs the question. That's what You're I was heading say, back home. Where? where are you going? Then what? I, I you know I think the next big the next big moto trip um, in my mind kind of has to be one of two things. It's either Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, or Ushuaia, Argentina. You got to go to Tuk to Yak Tuk instead of Prudhoe Bay. Have you heard of it? Is that? Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying it's. To, it's Dude, it's the on the map. actually on the Arctic Ocean as well. I think where's let me look up Prudhoe Bay because I've got a, I've got a route. That's that new, yeah, that's that new road that they just opened up, isn't it? Or yeah, it, it is. Though, right? It's a new road. It's you know it's different. It's it's a it's a harder road, of course. Prudhoe Bay is cool too, um, but it's yes, yeah, right on the Arctic Ocean. It's the old ice road uh, trucker show. They used to have right, ice roads right. that would go up there. And uh, now it's, it's, it's not. So it's, you can drive up there. They built a road that they put pilings in that go down to, you know, permafrost or bedrock or whatever they want to call it. And uh, I don't yeah. know that it's farther north, but it's more remote. I don't know. That, well, not to tell you what to do or anything, but that, that's, my, that's where I want to go up there. That's, that's my northern trip. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I kind of forgot about that. But, yeah, I remember a few years ago when, when, they, when they opened that road. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, maybe I'll do that too. Yeah, do, do both. both. I mean, what the hell? I mean, it's, 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 <laughs> why, not? why not? Yeah. Well, so, any yeah, any closing? Mind, oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, in my mind, it, it kind of has to be one of those two trips. Yeah. I mean, Tierra del Fuego, Shuaia, that's, that's the dream. You know, some, there's, a, there's a girl I know that's trying to do a Porsche thing across Africa. Africa for some reason. I don't know, maybe it's the topography of it or something, but it just doesn't interest me as much as uh, South America. South America just looks I, incredible. I agree with you on that. Africa does, I, I'm not drawn to it all that much. And maybe I, I just don't like point. elephants and lions and giraffes that much. It just doesn't do it for me. <laughs> Mountains and... It, just, it, feels, it feels like there's a, just an extra amount of things trying to kill you in that country. Yes. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, there's there's some deserts and uh, well, more AK-47. Speaking of which, then, you also right. have Australia on your bucket list, Chris. I do. I, I want to do Australia, Australia in a few different ways. Absolutely. Yeah, Australia would be incredible. I, I want to go do Australia do and Tasmania <laughs> in one trip. Ooh, Tasmania would be cool, yeah. Mm -hmm. I always figure Australia kind of has to be done by doing a, a, a loop all the way around the perimeter. Yep. And then, and then a I, shot straight across the hall. That's exactly That's the route that I've got, too. It's the whole route, and then you cut it in half on the way home all the way back to Sydney or Brisbane or whatever it is. Yeah, that's I've got the exact same route planned. I also I really want to do, like, I think Southern Asia and India would also oh, be would be really incredible. I've, I've never been, you know, just I've in my younger days, I was really scared of food traveling places. Now I don't care. I'll, I'll try whatever as long as it's not bugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, <laughs> if you're gonna do India, the Porsche, uh, I, I, I've done India. Uh, I've done a lot of the Himalayas. You might need to put a lift kit on that thing. Mm. Maybe, maybe, maybe turn it into a monster truck. Well, I've, I'm building the Trooper too, so I've got an old Zuzu Trooper that I'm putting a TDI out of a Volkswagen in, and uh, I think that oh, cool. that might be my my adventure vehicle. Oh, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Yeah. But at least for stuff like that, for South America, I'm, I want to I want to take the 911 through through there for sure. That's that's the goal. Yeah. That's the that's the end goal is to somehow create what? Why are you shaking? Jake is shaking. His I'm head just at me. I'm thinking of you in the 911, and then your refusal to to lift it at all. You want it just slammed going through the middle of nowhere. I lifted it up a little bit. <laughs> there was a quarter inch. <laughs> it's, it's, it's lift. I've I've the honestly the bottom of my car looks like a war zone. Yeah. I mean it's oh I bet. It is, is my floor plate? pan is destroyed. Are you able to put like a giant skid plate on it or something? Well, it's it's a dry sump car, so there's no oil pan down there. So the lowest uh, part of the car is the is the floor pan, right? So and, you're just yeah. and so you're just pounding and the gas tank and the steering rack and the fuel lines. Yeah, I, I put a big dent in my gas tank actually in Idaho this year. Yeah, yeah, you, but I mean that can be dented. It's not a right, big deal. It's steel. Yeah, my old gas tank also looked yeah. like it was just destroyed but i don't i don't give a shit it's just it's it's a tool it's a machine you got to use it it's gonna you know that's one of the greatest parts about being a human being is that we have yeah. this we have this interesting way of being able to fix and maintain and make things better 
And I think that's really right. special right. that, you know, you think of like, you know, universal universe theory and physics and all this stuff. Everything's dying, right? Everything's dying and entropy, entropy and flying <laughs> away into space and all the energy is going to die. But Hey, here on earth in our short lifetimes, we can fix these machines. We can make them better. We can break them and we can do it over again. And I think that's yeah. pretty special. It is it's a lot of fun. Well, any parting words to uh, to the listeners about exploring or getting them out there to explore? Anything that you can encourage? I mean, really, just the same thing. I, I feel like I always preach, which is just you know, step out, step out the front door and make it happen. You know, there's really nothing that you know I feel like ought to be stopping anybody. Um, yeah, you just kind of kind of got to make that commitment and, and go try it and see if it's for you. Yeah, you just got to go in the room with the spider first. <laughs> you just gotta go in a room and then you can do other stuff later. Just start little and start small and get out Baby there steps. and explore. Yep. All right, man, dude, it's been a huge pleasure talking to you. And when you go do the tier de fuego thing, we'll have to talk again. Okay. Sounds good. All right, man. Do Thanks. you take care of yourself? Thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. We'll talk yeah. soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you as well. Talk to you. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. You know, you're right. I do look like a total cream puff compared to this guy. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, yeah. Are you kidding me? Of course you do. Do you think there's anything I can do? No. No. Not to even get close to this guy? You see photos of him? I know. he's. You are not going to mess with this dude. No, no. And he's right, though. Because, like, talking to him, he's just, like, the nicest guy. Well, that's how it usually works. Right? I know. You know but, it's... yeah, when he's rolling through cartel country, you go, oh, yeah, they're not going to mess with him. Probably not. It, it's just more t effort than it's worth, right? Yeah. Yeah, but but a cream puff and a $150,000 old yeah. finish 911. Nah, yeah, you're in trouble. I'm in trouble. <laughs> I'm, you're in big trouble. So my thought is for a trip like this, well, before we get into this, what have you got for us? Yeah, let's take a minute to talk about our sponsor, Petrol Box. Petrol Box, as you guys know, is an awesome monthly service made specifically for the automotive enthusiasts. Each month, they select items like T-shirts, hats, car gear, you got tools, detailing got supplies, apparel, all stickers, the pins, yes. air fresheners, yeah, pins like every month, like acrylic really enamel, cool. like enamel pins. Yeah, it was like the little John Player Special F1 car. Yeah, super cool. Yeah, my uh, my kids steal those and they they push them into the wood on their bunk bed. That's cool. Yeah, and they have all the stickers of all the cars are on there. They take they take them all. Yep, and all the tools. Like I was doing a a, a fuel filter, and I was like, "Oh crap, I don't have the tool for this." Uh, yes, yes, you do. I do. Because yep, it's the stuff that you get that you, you know, may not buy, but the uh, it's the, awesome that they come the uh, the the adjustable jaw filter wrench thing. Yep, I use that for many other purposes. That thing. I don't is think great. I got that one. Oh, you don't have that. That's what you're talking about, right? The 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 oil filter wrench. No, no, I'm talking the little quick disconnect uh, tools for a fuel filter line. Oh, oh yes, I got the those. Fuel, yeah, 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 yeah. For yeah. like, yes, I have used those. Yeah, as so it's well. all these cool tools that you don't normally have that get delivered right to you. Yeah, it's awesome. So there's actually two different levels hey, to Jay, choose from. What Christmas is coming. That's this right. This is a great this gift. This is a really good gift because a lot of times, especially people like us, where it's like. What do you buy? Yeah, I've gotten some pretty bad tools well, from people. Not only like, that, hey, check out this this tool. Oh, this is super cool. It works. It works on everything. Every nut and yeah, everything. Ever works, yeah. which means universal. It works on, which nothing means, works this on is, nothing. This is the it is the the roundoff.com tool. Yeah. It just breaks yep. every bolt. Seen on TV. <laughs> <laughs> <That's, laughs> the hey, other thing, God I was bless them. I really appreciate you trying to make my life well, easier. The other thing I was going to say is, guys like us, like if we need a tool or something, we just go buy it. Right. So yeah, it's a great. Well, gift. I do anyway. You don't. Your tools suck. I am investing in like a full cart and a full setup. You're you don't even have you have a bad toolbox. You've got a bad I cart. Have, You're I have a whole you bunch call of me stuff. disorganized. You are disorganized. But at least I have the tools. You got you need to. We need to have a talk. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say okay. Well, the nicest once tools done, you have, we we'll got do from a work tool off back in back. Well, we, I don't need to have a tool off. Well, we'll have a tool off on how the tools actually look because uh -huh. it might have been used for twenty years. <laughs> uh, you've got a, you've got a long way to go. <laughs> but I'm true. glad you're on the road. Of, of having some yes. tools. I remember when we were over there, I don't remember what we were working on, but I was like, where the hell is everything? And it's just everywhere. It, it, it is everywhere. Yeah, you need to keep it. It's like, oh, to, well, they're all junk drawers, basically. Yeah, yeah. You, you literally have like file cabinets with tools in them, yes, basically. Yes, I do. Which works great for big stuff, like drills and stuff like that. Yeah. But yeah, not for so here, here, sockets. Not a sponsor. Uh -huh. The Harbor Freight middle of the line toolboxes are amazing that's what i ordered they're so did, oh you did you're yeah. on you're on your way what color did you get 
black. Okay. Black got, wood top. It'll match everything else. That's great. And I did, yeah, I did all this research on them. They're like, no, actually, this is better than a lot of I think of it's kind of stuff. like their, and their icon tool line is pretty good too. I think this is kind of like, they're get them and get you in the door kind of thing. It's like their flagship item. Like, oh, we've got really nice toolboxes. Come and buy all our stuff that smells like the rubber in China <laughs> as well. And also, like the, the bad stuff. Like, what is it? The Pittsburgh steel yeah. stuff. Oh, Not good. Stay away. Stay away. Pittsburgh Although, jack stands. No, 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 no. So Those what, were the ones that were recalled. Do you remember this? Yeah. And then the ones they replaced them with for the recall also had to get recalled because they also failed. Yeah, yeah. Things that are going to save your life or are endangering your life, buy them. Buy nice things. Yes. I have, uh, so what I've started doing for the kid's birthday uh -huh. is I buy them one. I got them toolboxes. Okay. And I just started doing this. So Irene just had her birthday and I did buy her some Pittsburgh steel wrenches. So That's I'm fine. Just like, I want to have her you have a nice little toolbox. I'm going to yeah. give her, this is such a lame thing to do for presents because you know, right now they don't care. Oh yeah. They're like really dad. But down the road, they will really love that toolbox of the tools that I bought for them. I yeah, think, I think it'll cool. be, I think it'll be For cool. Sure. So I, you know, I go there and I buy tools. So or, if you realize they're going to just inherit all your tools anyways. Uh, well, hopefully not anytime soon. Let's let's hope for okay. you know, some time where they can use their own tools for a little, <laughs> for a little while. Plus, we it's always, got really off track. You realize this is an ad, yes, for Petrol Box. Petrol Box. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyways, two levels to choose from for Petrol Box. You can have the twenty bucks for a month. That's the uh, Petrol Box Basic, and then the. Pretzel Box Premium gets you even more gear for $39.95 a month. How do you get it? You go to mypetrolbox.com and use the code OVERCREST to get $6 off your first month. Hey, Jake. Yes. Did you know that we have uh, t-shirts in the OVERCREST store? I do. I'm wearing one. I, we're wearing the same shirt in different colors. That's right. I um, just want to have remind everybody to check out the store. We're putting new stuff in there all the time. You can see what's there. Go to overcrestproductions.com slash store. I think it's slash no. store. I'm pretty sure it's slash store or just go there and you can click on or apparel or, or merch apparel or whatever it is. Or, and we've I got all kinds probably, of, you know what this, uh, okay. You oh. always create work for me because I have to create redirects every time we say the wrong <laughs> thing on the air. Do you know this? No. So because you said this now, I'm going to have to go in. I'm going to create slash store also goes to the store. Hold on. I'm gonna slash look apparel also goes to the store. I'm, go, I'm looking around. Merchandise also goes to the store. It is page i found <laughs> <laughs> which is why i'm gonna have to go do that yeah oh sorry about that guys uh, <laughs> that's happened so many times on the podcast uh so everything that we have in the store yes look it's expensive right but most of it is done and made here it's, it is, print, yes. it's printed here in america yes. by, and by, it's high quality and it's high quality stuff it is not like we don't go and pick out oh this is the cheapest t-shirt yeah no that we, we do the opposite, opposite we actually. do the opposite what is the nicest shirt that we can do yes. what is the nicest printing that we can do everything is really really nice and it should last you a really long time from the hats the shirts the stickers everything yep. it's all really nice stuff okay uh what was i saying before we went on like a huge enormous no clue i don't remember what i don't know travel your girl's something. toolbox toolbox that's that was i don't remember what i was saying damn it oh well, well what else do you want to talk about <laughs> <laughs> i got nothing that's no it, i don't huh? know you were talking about exploration well, oh you were gonna get uh yeah you were gonna get kidnapped oh yeah okay so the plan that i what i think i have to do yeah is i also want to film and I have ideas for filming like a okay. series when I do this. So I won't be alone anyway. Okay. I'm going to have like a follow vehicle of some sort, whether we bring my trooper or we bring like a sprinter van okay. or whatever the case may be. There's going to be Good. like. So there's more things to target and steal once they can. Yeah, I you. think it's a product of opportunity. People, thieves are lazy. If they look in your car and they see it's a manual, they won't even bother. They're like, damn, oh. damn, damn, damn fact we've been we did a news episode on this I none know, of the cars that are stolen but i'm are thinking yeah i don't know it's it's a product of opportunity and ease if i'm alone eating beans in my 911 yes i'm gonna die right but if i'm in a hotel room eating beans with all my buddies and uh -huh. everything is parked in a in a place uh -huh. probably not gonna die if i'm camping Do you remember our episode with brandon where they knocked on his hotel room door. And Brandon was alone sleeping <laughs> on a cum-stained mattress. Okay? True. Yeah. So we're, I, I, although I, he, he's a 
speaking of Brandon, he's going to be on the podcast uh, next, week. next week. Yeah, he's been out traveling, getting a suburban. Which, by the way, I love how he was giving me crap about like, oh, you didn't even get that truck running down in Texas. Do you realize how long he's been out on this trip trying yeah, to get but this he stupid suburban going? Yeah, but he wouldn't got a suburban that's been sitting in a field. You wouldn't even go to like Dallas and buy something that already runs. That's how lazy you were. It did not run. Yeah, but you were in a place that had a car quest next door. You weren't trying to do yeah, an but it engine. Was like Thirty minutes away, Jake, which is why I hate Jake. Dallas. You were. He's trying to get an old diesel from nineteen ninety six. Which he had to go through like three engines to, to get it going. in a suburban that's been sitting in a field. You were trying to get a tr- a Chevy truck with a Chevy engine. Running I understand when you were you were stone it's totally stroll. different. Okay, just totally so we're clear. different. Anyway, but he, I, yeah, yeah, and that we're gonna video that one too. So if you'd like to see us interacting with Brandon. It's always a lot of fun. He's going to be here. And then Abby, who traveled with him, we're going to probably yeah, figure a way to like super cool. Super cool. We're going to have see if we can get her on, on a Zoom call to see if we can have her participate as well. Make sure that she's involved in the conversation because I do want to hear all about that. Yes. And absolutely. That That'll be next that. week. See you guys next time. Take care.